Good evening, everybody. I suppose we're ready to get started. I'm uh, going to talk to you tonight for about a half an hour about the Technical Edge, which is the new webinar that we put together. And as it says on the screen, the idea is to uh, keep technical analysis on a non-technical level. And uh, we uh, recently completed a, uh, a six-week course called the Options Edge, and it was very successful, very well received. Uh, I've worked with Steve Bigelow for um, several years now on a variety of things, and he and I got together and decided that we could expand on how candlesticks work with options, and that led to this current uh, new uh, webinar in which we're going to talk about how option or how candlesticks work with technical analysis, not only candlesticks but other forms of technical analysis as well. So I'm going to jump right in and get started today. Uh, we're going to uh, keep it nice and simple, like I said, and I'm going to focus on one technique that I want to tell you about. And uh, this uh, information is a very small segment of one of the eight sections in this uh, technical edge presentation. And um, this uh, is a good example of how something that's usually considered very complex can be converted to something or explained in a way that's very simple. I think that it always makes more sense to keep things as basic as possible uh, and not lose half of the people by over over explaining or by or by uh, being overly technical. So, when I talk about a probability matrix, I'm talking about a uh, type of signal that uh, presents and sets up a likely trading range that is um, dynamic. Usually, when you see resistance and support drawn out. On a um, on a chart, usually are involved with straight lines, and uh, the idea is that once price moves above resistance or below support, it's a breakout, and it could lead to a new trading range, or it could retreat back. And uh, a probability matrix is a uh, dynamic range that tracks how resistance and support moves from place to place and within trends and beyond trends. Uh, in such a way that isn't the same as resistance and support, but is a form of trading range. Uh, this helps you to easily identify uh, signals, especially reversal signals. And um, this is especially the case during consolidation, a sideways moving trend, which a lot of people think is the most difficult trend to, uh, to work with. But in fact, as you'll see with this probability matrix, uh, the Consolidation trend is one of the easiest uh, to uh, to identify coming breakout and uh, a likely reversal from consolidation into bullish or bearish. And this also helps to time entry and exit through recognition of candlesticks, which change probability. And um, one of the things that happens with candlesticks in a consolidation movement is that you might see a reversal signal as the price moves out of the consolidation range above resistance or below support. And if you focus strictly on price, reversal should only be found at the bottom of a downtrend or the top of an uptrend. <clears throat> In the case of consolidation, a reversal candlestick can actually work as a reversal of a trend from consolidation to a dynamic. So the reversal has a different meaning in that sense. And this is a, a very useful in creating your trading system. And of course, the signal I'm talking about here is Bollinger Bands. It um, identifies not only time when price moves, uh, but when it moves out of a range. And it's a very powerful probability matrix because you have a middle line and you have the upper and lower bands that are two standard deviations removed from that center band. And uh, that makes them a very strong, likely range in which you should expect to see trading. So when trading moves outside of that, it's a strong signal. And the way the Bollinger is constructed is the middle band is a simple moving average. And upper and lower are simple moving averages that are removed two standard deviations away from the middle band. And um, Bollinger band signals uh, coming change very strongly. And among the very uh, uh, powerful kinds of signals you get from Bollinger Band, one of my favorites is the Bollinger Squeeze. 
This occurs when you see the daily breadth of trading become increasingly narrow in a very short period of time. And this is especially strong when it takes place very close to the upper band or lower band. That's a signal that there's likely to be a breakout because when you see a narrowing range, you expect it to be followed by a wider range, and that's when breakout is likely to occur. So I want to show you an example of how this works. On the chart of Gannett, you have a uh, consolidation range that uh, generally is between about 1475 and about 1575, uh, about a three-point range. And that began in March and extended into April. And then what happened is if you, if you look at the area that's highlighted and called the Bollinger Squeeze, you can see the daily breadth of trading became extremely narrow. <clears throat> a couple of things happened at that point. Uh, as expected, not only did the narrow range lead to a much broader range, uh, and in fact here you see the range is very broad, but the second thing that happened is that the, um, uh, the bands started trading, ab or the, the price started trading above the upper band. And this is where the strength of this comes in, is that uh, this trading above the upper band is very unusual. And to judge how unusual it is, look back over the whole six-month period. You'll see there are very few times when trading goes outside of the bands. And um, it often um, precedes a, um, a change in direction. Here you have a couple of sessions at the beginning of January that traded below the lower band, and that led to a pretty big drop in the price. Uh, since that point of about uh, the 25th of January, the price uh, had not traded below the lower band at all. And so what that tells you is that the, um, uh, the strength of of the price moving beyond the bands is very, very strong. And here, uh, there have been a couple of very brief forays outside of the upper band, but absolutely nothing like what occurred in the four sessions immediately after the uh, Bollinger squeeze. So this reveals a very strong signal right here, is that you have the Bollinger squeeze, which uh, forecasts a bullish move. And it forecasts bullish because it occurs in the area between the middle and upper bands. And it's, it, it is a squeeze in the true sense that it went from a fairly medium trading range on the dailies down to a very, very narrow. So that's what a Bollinger squeeze looks like. And that's, that's one of the strongest signals that you're about to break out of consolidation. Now, the, the second um, signal that's worthy is called the M top. And what happens here is that uh, price actually forms the letter M. And uh, it's a bearish signal that's very much like the uh, head and shoulders or double top signals as far as the strength of the signal. What you expect to see is uh, the M form and then price to break down below the lower band after that. In fact, that's the key segment that makes it a legitimate um, M top is that it's a requirement that the final leg of the M should break below support or in this case below the um, lower band of Bollinger. I have an example here of that. Here's Toyota, and um, I've drawn an M on this chart to show you what happens here, that um, there's several things to be aware of, that it's, it's very much like a double top or head and shoulders, that the uh, beginning of March, you have the first leg of the M, and then it retreats back down, comes back up, and retreats back down. And as, as that last leg completes, it ends below the lower band. And in fact, it doesn't just end below the lower band, but it takes price down below the lower band for five consecutive sessions, which is very powerful because uh, that has not happened at any time previous to this. There was one uh, period here in early January where it closed below there for three sessions, and that uh, forecast a, um, a strong downtrend. It... Um, uh, rallied a little bit and then retreated again and uh, closed another couple of sessions. But this one in uh, early April, you saw actually five sessions close below. And so that that supported this idea that this was that, that this M top was a bearish move. As it turned out, it didn't last for very long. It only lasted from um, uh, about the beginning of April to about April 11th. But 
that's enough sometimes to, to make a trade. Once you see that the M has completed and trading has gone below, at that point the stock was at about 104. You knew it was going to go down a little further. Uh, you could have gotten at least five points out of that as a, as a bearish trade. So this is a powerful signal. The opposite of the M top is a W bottom. It's uh, exactly opposite. It's a bullish signal that's very much like an inverse head and shoulders. It also is about as strong as a double bottom signal. And um, the key element is the same as a W top. The requirement is that the final leg of the W should break above resistance, which in this case would mean breaking above the um, upper band. So let me show you an example of this one. This is a case of uh, U.S. Steel. And you have a consolidation here that goes from about 650 up to about um, about almost $9 a share. And um, a couple of things going on here that are interesting. First of all, the W bottom is very specifically um, identifiable here. Now, the question has come up before that how can you tell the difference between a W bottom and an M top? I mean, you could draw an M top from uh, late January and go up, down, up, and you could have a, an M top uh, that overlaps the W bottom, but that would not be a legitimate signal because you'd still be within range. In the case of the W bottom, notice what happens as it completes. The price moves above the upper bands for six consecutive sessions, and that makes it very strong. And um, you have a couple of other signals that confirm this, actually three other signals. You have the three white soldiers above the upper bands, which is a strong bullish signal, is confirmed by a set of volume spikes that are about twice as much as even the, uh, the largest spike from the past six months. And then uh, you also have the, uh, the uh, momentum measured by, by relative strength index going into overbought, which is kind of a contrary signal because uh, a lot of times momentum will give off a false signal because the move is so extreme and so fast. And that's exactly what happened here with the momentum uh, taking the price as high as it did and as fast as it did, uh, not only outside of the bands, but all the way from 8 to almost 16. This will be a doubling of the price. Uh, this chart only covers about um, uh, 10 points from bottom to top. So this move from about uh, 7 up to 16, 8 to 16, is a very strong move. It, it uh, it doubles the price within about um, a two-week period. And that might be one reason why the momentum shows overbought, because the move is so extreme and, uh, and so sudden that this, this has a, a meaning that, it, that this particular case, there might be a, a divergence here that uh, means that the, um, the momentum signal uh, can be ignored because there are so many other strong signals. And again, just to summarize the strong signals that are very bullish are the W bottom, the volume spikes, and the three white soldiers. Now, admittedly, this could top off at some point up here in the end of March. But in order to consider that a legitimate bearish signal, you'd need to see um, something more going on here than is going on. It seems like this has been just a big spurt in the price. and. Um, the other thing that happens here, which we'll get to a little bit later, is notice how narrow the bandwidth is uh, in the beginning of February. It's about a point and a half. And in fact, throughout most of this chart, it's about that same bandwidth. But now, as this um, price jumped up the way it did, the bandwidth uh, not only uh, went higher, but uh, went actually uh, on the bottom side below what's shown on this chart. So in this case, the bandwidth really expanded a lot. And that's a symptom of increased volatility. So that's something else to be aware of. Another signal that you often find with Bollinger Bands, and again, this, this kind of format of presentation here is typical of, um, of how I'm going to be presenting material in the eight-week course. Uh, B. Meta asks, how can you identify or scan for before they trend up or down. Well, let me go back to this chart for a second. The uh, formation of the W bottom is something that happens during consolidation. 
and uh, I think the marker that it's about to go uh, into a um, into a, a big move outside of that range begins with the volume spikes. That's a signal that uh, something is happening uh, that should be paid attention to. And uh, once it goes up above the upper bands, the the move is confirmed by the three white soldiers. So. There, is, there are plenty of signals happening at the same time here that, that this is going to be a successful breakout. Doug, Doug D. asks, is that increased volatility indicative of an upcoming trend change? Uh, yeah, I think that the uh, if you're talking about the volatility in the, um, in the bandwidth, it can be, although because of the nature of Bollinger Bands, this is a consequence of this very strong upward move of the price. So the test here to see if the um, its volatility uh, is uh, indicative of a uh, upcoming trend change would be to see what happens over the next few weeks. Does it settle down to its more normal range, or does the range continue to grow as the price continues to move? This is a stock this particular stock, U.S. Steel, that has had moments of high volatility. And so that's the thing to watch is, do the bands retreat back to their normal level or do they stay wide like this? Because that's something that's, uh, that's worth keeping an eye on to determine whether or not you're looking at a new trend change. It's the same sort of argument as when you're in a consolidation range as we were for the month of January and February. How do you know when you're going to be moving out of that range? And that's why these W bottom and volume spike and, and then the candlestick signal are so powerful here because they do indicate a successful breakout. And uh, normally I would like to see the three white soldiers leading a breakout, but in this case where we're focusing on the Bollinger Band patterns, uh, in this case the three white soldiers act as a confirmation signal that, uh, that these uh, occurrences are likely to represent a successful breakout from the consolidation range. And that's where Bollinger comes in handy. All right, so the next type of signal is the island cluster. And this is typified by a small group of, of uh, sessions, usually uh, three to five or somewhere in that range, that are marked by gaps on uh, both before and after. And then the price reverses and moves in the opposite direction as the next step. So when this occurs above the upper band, that's very bearish. When it occurs below the lower band, it should be very bullish. And again, you need confirmation of these things. Jamie says uh, that he has a template that compares Keltner and Bollinger on the same chart. When the Bollinger is inside the Keltner, it's a very strong move likely to come. Yeah, and this, this brings up a good point, which is that the, um, uh, the way you do charting you can easily combine numerous signals. And I think that doing an overlay of Bollinger and Keltner is one of many ways that you can uh, add strength to what the indications are. I personally have not used Keltner, but I've looked at it a few times. And I think that the reason I don't use it is because I usually find it to be um, about as strong as Bollinger. But in a case where you are less certain about that, you can certainly combine these. Uh, my charting service is stockcharts.com, and all the charts you see here are provided by stockcharts.com. And I think that it would be a, a reasonable um, point to say that you could uh, add Keltner. It's very easy to overlay any number of signals on those charts, and you can certainly add Keltner to Bollinger. Mike asked, do you use the standard uh, Bollinger Band time periods, or have you ever tried changing them? The shorter time gets more reaction. Well, you know what, Mike? I think that one of the reasons I like to use the standards on, on both Bollinger Bands and on momentum and a lot of other signals is that getting more signals often leads to false signals. And I would rather get something that's an exceptional signal, as we see with Bollinger Bands, and um, consider that a very strong indication of what's going on. If I get a lot of signals, I'm never really sure if they're, if they're accurate. The shorter time signal does get more reaction. And I think the time it's appropriate to use those is if you're doing day trading and swing trading in a very narrow uh, time range, you know, three to five days, then I think that it makes sense, as you suggest, to use a shorter time period. So it's, 
certainly um, possible to do that. And if you have a trading system that requires generating more signals, that's a good way to do it. Let me show you some examples of a couple of island clusters here. This first one is uh, five sessions. It's bullish. Or excuse me, it's bearish. It uh, happens right at the end of January. The reason this is not particularly strong is because it occurs within the range of the Bollinger Bands. And um, so that, that means that it, it could be stronger if it were outside. Uh, it does lead to a, a bearish move, as expected. And then um, there's a second two-session island cluster that's not particularly strong. But if you note the on both of these, the gaps, both before and after, this is what makes these strong reversals. And uh, in this case, it happens to be a pretty good candlestick as well. Um, then the third one is, ironically, uh, the strongest of these three because it ha occurs above the upper band, but it uh, doesn't have much of a reaction. So here's the strongest one. It's a bearish signal. takes price from 118 down to about 108. So there's, there is a 10-point decline, but after that, the range seems to consolidate. So it, it, it only lasts about a week. It doesn't last very long at all. But this is what they look like. This is what to look for, especially looking for them outside of the bands. And so the trading above and below is, is a significant event. And this gets back to that idea that, uh, that um, you know, that was just brought up by, by uh, someone else, that, that uh, by shortening the period you get more signals. But one of the reasons for keeping the signals at the, at the default is that when you see a consecutive s series of trades above the upper band, it tends to confirm the bullish trend. When you see a series of trades below the lower band, it tends to um, tends to give off a very strong bearish signals. And again, you need to have these confirmed. And as Mike said, you can shorten the time period and get more of these kinds of, of signals. Um, and that's appropriate if you're doing a very short-term trading. But for the usual um, uh, candlestick trader and options trader and somebody who's looking at the uh, 7 to 10 day uh, position in in a in a particular holding, uh, you you might not want to shorten that period to make sure you don't get false signals. But let me show you something that, that demonstrates this trading outside of the bands. There's a couple of examples on this one. On Raytheon, you had a series of um, five days above the upper band, and this confirmed what you saw previous to that in the white candlestick here in about uh, November 16th that told you that, yes, the stock is, is on a bullish move. Now, once it retreated back into range, that indicated that this might be the end of a, what looks like about a week and a half bull, bull move. Now, over here in uh, January, you had an even stronger uh, situation where the uh, stock moved into a bearish move. And here you had uh, numerous uh, trades below the lower bands. and um, that ended rather abruptly toward the end of January. And then another interesting thing happened right here, which is that you went from a rather narrow uh, Bollinger range of about 127 down to about 123, or four points. By the time this ended, around February 16th, it went from 115 up to one, almost 130, which is 15 points. So seeing this narrowing to widening and then back to narrowing is another indication of the changes in volatility. These upper uh, trading above the band, above the upper band and below the lower band are simply um, uh, as effective as trend lines in showing you what's happening at that moment. But in order to spot the end of that trend, you do need the candlesticks and other signals. Now, another signal that I like to use Bollinger for is that um, it often tracks resistance very, very closely. And it sets up what I like to think of as a reliable dynamic resistance trend. As I said at the beginning, resistance most often is thought of as a straight line. But look at this chart for a second, and you'll see what I mean. In AT&T, if you look at the upper band, it tracked that uh, high point of the price very, very closely. And uh, this could be thought of as a resistance range. If you try to draw a resistance line on this chart, you'd have to draw it from about November 9th up on a straight line, and it runs into price around uh, January 25th, and then another one from February 8th up to about um, 
March 21st without an indication of it ending. But when you use the upper band as a dynamic resistance, it can effectively show you that this, in fact, is in a bullish trend, and um, and it can be used very effectively. AT&T has a nice narrow trading range, so that's helpful in this kind of tracking. In a bullish market, you see the upper band tracking resistance, and in a bearish market, you tend to see the opposite. Paul asks, how were the bands created? Is it after closing the opening, or are they a history of real, or real time? The bands are created by a... Uh, a uh, simple average, usually 20 days to create the middle band. And then the upper and lower bands are the same period of time, but they are calculated as two standard deviations away from the middle band. And um, because that's a rather complex calculation, it's fortunate for us um, modern people that uh, uh, on an online charting service, all you have to do is click on Bollinger Bands, and these are calculated automatically for you. But these are a simple moving average for the middle band and two standard deviations above for the upper and two standard deviations below for the lower. And uh, uh, it, it would be uh, worthwhile, uh, if you're not familiar with these, to look this up online and read up on how these, how these work and how they're calculated. Mike says, looks like Bollinger Band set to 20 periods and RSI is set to 14. Uh, would it be better if they were the same? Well, you can make an argument for that, Mike, but I think that um, what I like about RSI at 14, if you look at this on this chart, for example, it moves very briefly into overbought only three times in six months. And to me, the lack of signal is itself a signal. What this tells me is that on the standard 14 session average of, of RSI, of which the calculation is a lot different than Bollinger, by the way, but RSI is telling me that there's not a very strong likelihood that this trend is is um, is becoming overbought. And so I would take great comfort in the fact that I'm not getting a signal. If this were moving up into overbought and staying there for a long period of time, period of time, I would be very concerned and come to believe that, in fact, this is a strong signal that the uptrend was about to end. So uh, I, I think you ask a re an interesting question. And by noting that Bollinger is 20 periods and RSI is 14. But if you look at the calculations for these two indicators, you'll see that they're, they're vastly different. And I think that the um, analysis of different periods isn't, uh, isn't as much of a key as it is to determine what they show using these standards. I, I encourage anybody to play with the periods and, uh, uh, and see how they interact when you change them. A lot of people like to take RSI down from 14 down to 6. And if you do that, you get a lot of signals. And uh, the conclusion I've reached, and in fact, I, I get into this in the course itself, I, I do compare the 20 signal RSI, to, or excuse me, the 14 session RSI to the 6. And the result of it is that you get a lot of false signals. And so that's why I like to keep it at that default. So looking at the opposite of um, resistance, Bollinger also tends to track support, but it tends to happen uh, primarily in a downtrend. And that's the difference, that resistance tracking is usually seen in an uptrend, and support tracking is usually seen in a downtrend. So here I have one more chart to show you. Uh, this is a case of rack space hosting. In this case, it's not as consistent as AT&T was, but you can see that if you follow this, it, it marks the general range of support fairly accurately, with an exception here in February where there was a, a big dip below support. But generally speaking, uh, this tracks support very closely, especially for November, December, and January, and then picks it up again in mid-March and takes it through the end of April. John asks, do you use RSI to buy and sell signals or just overbought, oversold? Uh, well, John, I, I consider the RSI, once it moves into overbought or oversold, to be a very strong confirmation, especially of candlestick signals and reversal and of um, uh, moment, other momentum, but uh, especially volume spikes. And so if you see a case where uh, the, um, the price is trending and it comes down to the bottom of a downtrend or goes to the top of an uptrend and you find a reversal on the candlestick, if... Um, RSI goes into overbought or oversold at the same time. That's a very strong form of confirmation. 
So the point here is that um, this is the way that I, I treat a topic, and uh, Bollinger Bands is a, a one of the more complex ones that I deal with, but I, I attempted here to explain some of the uses of Bollinger Bands uh, to give you all an idea of how I'm going to uh, be uh, doing the uh, eight weeks of courses. Uh, they're, bro they're broken into specific sections, and in the uh, promotional material that will come up in about three slides, you'll be able to go and uh, and and look at the outline of that course. You probably should have received that by now anyway, but I think that uh, this this was an attempt to show you how I move through a particular topic. This uh, Bollinger Bands material comes from uh, the Moving Average Week and uh, is a small part of that. Bob says, how do you interpret price action in the middle of the Bollinger Bands? Well, Bob, what that tells me is that uh, that's in range, and uh, there again, I look for W tops, W bottoms, M tops, island clusters. I look for all of these signals that would tell me that there's a likelihood that we can see a breakout, and uh, when price then uh, merges above or below the uh, above the upper band or below the lower band, that tells me that something important is going on. So this is a uh, like I said, I call it a probability matrix because it does define how and when price is evolving and changing and volatility is is uh, expanding or contracting and um, overall it's a very useful signal for production of, of candlesticks. So the question is uh, does consistency equal success? Um, Bollinger Bands and this this is very much uh, to the question that Bob asked about how to interpret price action. They reveal how Bollinger Bands these examples show how you can manage price change and actually interpret chart information uh, just by making a few observations. And Bollinger by, is by no means the, the only signal or a signal that works without confirmation. You always need confirmation, but this is a particularly powerful one, especially when you have a consolidation trend and you want to look for signals that something might be about to change. So there's three principles at work in this trading program involving technical analysis. It applies in all types of trends, not only bullish and bearish, but also consolidation. Uh, it is the recognition that uh, candlesticks are the starting point in most situations, uh, supported by and confirmed by other technical signals, and this immensely improves your uh, timing for entry and exit. And uh, if you apply these principles consistently, you're going to be successful. And by that I mean that you're going to, um, you're going to, you're never going to be 100% correct in your timing, but you're going to beat the averages and you're going to do better than the average. If we start with the idea that the market is a 50-50 proposition, using a few of these uh, techniques that are covered in the course, such as the Bollinger Bands, will, um, will certainly improve your ability to interpret charts and to make better time trades. So the complex gets transformed into the simple. And now I'm going to uh, go to the final chart and turn it over to Steve. Are you there, Steve? This isn't a chart, actually, but a screen. What we have here is the uh, idea that candlesticks, which is east, meets the other situations, which are west, western technicals. And uh, this course is designed to uh, take, take you through eight weeks worth of uh, specific um, topics that are technical analysis topics. Thank you, Becky. Becky just put up the, um, the tech edge, which makes it easier for you to, um, to link to it. Uh, the whole idea here is uh, these, these are not sequential courses. Uh, there's no one type of technical analysis that is more important or, than the other or is a building block. But I have broken it out into eight sections. And uh, as I said, Bollinger Bands is a small part of the moving average section. Uh, other topics we cover in there, of course, are candlesticks, western indicators, trend lines. Um, moving averages, of course, is the Bollinger. Uh, but many, many other uh, topics are touched on in, during the eight weeks. And so are there any questions? Steve, do you have anything you'd like to add? Looks to me like Steve might have stepped away. 
Richard asks, will the courses be recorded in case I'm not available? Yes, all of the courses are recorded, and I, as I understand it, everyone who signs up for the course uh, will uh, be able to attend the um, weekly presentations, which begin next Saturday on June 9th at um, 11 o'clock Eastern Time, 11 a.m., and uh, they, the recordings will be sent to you automatically as well. So if you miss one week or if you'd rather just get the recordings, they will be sent to you if you sign up. If you sign up for these courses, the um, each week's recording is sent to you automatically, as I understand it. And so I hope that you will uh, check out the outline, which is on the website, on the Candlestick Forum website, and that uh, you will also take a look at some of the... Um, some of the information that is included on this link. And that you'll find it very interesting and useful. And uh, I think that the response to the um, options edge was very positive. And uh, uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was a six-week course. This one is an eight-week course. We're going to do it every Saturday starting June 9th, excuse me, July 9th. And, um, It'll be eight consecutive weeks, and I think that, uh, like I said, if you can't attend one or if you'd rather, you can just rely on the recordings, and uh, I think it'll be very useful to you. Uh, this, the sessions are designed, uh, Joel asks, how long are the Saturday sessions? They're designed to be one hour, so they'll go from about 11 Eastern to about noon on Eastern. I, I found out with the options course that we usually went over a little bit, depended something somewhat on uh, the number of questions or the types of questions that were asked. But um, I think that uh, it, there'll be at least one hour. And I try to strive to, to keep it at an hour so that people can plan their day a little better. But um, plan on one hour for each week. And again, that's 11 a.m., uh, eight Saturdays in a row starting on July 9th. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for attending. I appreciate the feedback and the questions. And uh, oh, one more question just came up. Richard asks, are we able to get options as recording if we didn't sign up for the past classes? Well, I, I believe that the uh, recordings are all available for sale. Uh, and uh, once again, Richard, I encourage you to uh, check with us on the uh, um, on the forum website, and uh, that you should be able to get the information there. And uh, if not, I would suggest you write to someone on the website and ask how you can um, how you can get those. Chip asks, "Do we have a table of contents or syllabus syllabus for the course?" Yes, we do. And let me see if I can find that and put a link up to it here. Hold on. Uh, let's see. I'm uh, not finding it immediately, but um, what I would like to suggest is that, uh, yeah, hold on a second. I, I'm going to open up my email and see if I can find it there because it was on the email. And uh, let me see if I can find it. Bear with me a second. I'm looking now. Hold on. I believe I... 
Nope, I haven't found it. Bear with me. Let me see what this is. I think I found it here. Ah, here we go. I have found it. Let me see if I can attach this to the uh, to the uh, thing. Okay. What is this? It's a it's a word file, which could be a problem, but. Um, I'm going to copy it. No, I can't do that. Um, I'm going to have to offer to send this to anyone and everyone who's interested. Um, it is available on the website, but now I. Yes, hello? Yes. Uh, oh, it is. Oh, great. Well, thank you, and thank you, Becky. I appreciate that because. Uh, I do want to be able to have that, and I just wasn't sure uh, what that was. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm relieved because I was not having an uh, easy time finding it. So there it is, folks. That's the syllabus. All right. Well, unless anyone has anything else, I think we're done here for the evening. <laughs> well, Jay, uh, Jay says the problem with the website is not unusual. It's impossible to find things there. Well, Jay, I wasn't really going to the website. I was trying to go to my own email. So I think that uh, the problem with trying to copy uh, text attachments and uh, make them show up somewhere else is something that is uh, constantly puzzling to me. Yes, Chuck, the session is recorded. Paul, see you in class. You're welcome, Doug. You're welcome, Jean. Everyone else, you're welcome. I, I'm glad you all attended, and I hope to see you um, not only in the uh, the, day, the trading room, but also uh, signed up for the course. This is this half hour here was a very small portion of the material we're going to cover and of the of the approach we're going to take. Lots and lots of charts. The entire course is over 100 stock charts that I've marked up with various different kinds of signals and interaction of signals. So I think it'll be very informative for you. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. All right, everybody. Well, I'm signing off now, so good night, and I hope to see you next Saturday. <laughs>